Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight, especially a little bit of a rainy night. Um, if people do want to get drinks, I'm just going to be speaking for the next little while, so I, I totally get it. But um, yeah, what I wanted to talk about today is something that I'm calling a 360-degree view of strategy. And really, in a way, how do we do a better job of thinking about strategy overall? So I don't know how many people have leaders that um, basically say something like this, you know, here's our strategic themes for the next year, and then basically produces a plan, which is just a list of features, essentially. Um, and that's usually what I would refer to as really kind of the starter strategy, right? We're not really defining how people should be making decisions. We're not doing what I think is really the basis for a really good strategy is that you're being able to map a way to make a hard decision easier for the team. And what that usually ends up resulting in is that about a month later, the entire team just basically says, we don't have a strategy, right? Because that plan list that we had that we wrote down in that very long document that's probably 20 or 30 pages long is no longer current. It's out of date. It no longer has most of the projects that we're actually working on are different than the ones that we had actually put there. And so that idea of a strategy as a plan is actually a very flawed premise. And I would, I would say it's something that I see a lot of people do in a lot of the work I do. So I guess when I start to think about the way that strategy should actually do this, right, we, we exist in very uncertain and complex environments, right? I would say that product management, one of our key meta skills is really to wrangle and kind of dance with uncertainty and to help interpret it for the rest of our teams. And the truth is, is that the complex environments we exist within usually means that it's not even like our competitors that are our biggest threat, but it's actually the environment that we try to thrive within. And so if we want to be doing a better job inside of those future worlds, we want to continue to be able to execute and have optionality as a strategy, we need to be you know, more intentional uh, with the way that we think about this. And see, that, that's a callback to this meetup. So there we go. So I'm gonna talk about 360 strategies. This is uh, what I would refer to as maybe an experimental framework, something that I've been thinking a lot about and been starting to experiment with with teams inside of Google, um, as well as teams outside of Google. And so what this really tries to focus on is this relationship between uncertainty and importance. Because the, the truth is, is that when we try to actually manage the uncertainty of the world, there's some uncertainties that are really vital to the way we end up doing our jobs, the way that our organizations exist, the way they continue to survive in some way. And there's other uncertainties that just aren't that meaningful in some way. And so, you know, I used to be a consultant, so everything starts with a two by two, of course. Um, and so the two things I think are most interesting for us to start to talk about when it comes to strategic concepts and the way we start to lay out strategic concepts, one is really this idea of kind of, whenever we end up building a strategy, there are components of it that are highly certain. And then there's components of it that are maybe earlier on, we don't know if they're gonna work yet, but that difference between highly uncertain and certain um, end up being very helpful for us to identify. And then the next thing is that there are not only inside of strategy the fact that we should be designating what is important for us to do, but I would say that every great strategic leader that I've ever worked with will usually be very definitive about what things we should not also be working on. And so this to me kind of creates a map. And I wanna talk about these different quadrants that end up being inside this map because I think they're very helpful and important. And so the, the first one is really this idea of like working strategies. So these are things that we know we want to do. These are things that we're very certain are working now. Um, they're also very important that we continue to do them. Um, and the way that we end up, you know, usually this is that starter strategy that I was talking about earlier. It's the list of things that we know that we need to do right now. And there are generally signals that these things are working, right? There'll be KPIs, we may have OKRs, and the KR component is actually defined. It's not just like, a baselining type of situation. Um, but these signals are being tracked in a very meticulous way, usually ideally. Um, but we're able to judge that these strategies continue to work. And when we think they st stop working, it means that they're no longer these definitive strategies that we now can keep on depending on. I think the next thing ends up being this area of aspirational strategies. And what I found a lot of the time inside of um, the way that people end up doing work is that we have a lot of things that are plans that we're very certain about. And then there's a lot of things that we end up including that are where we want to go in some way. And this harkens back to a really important kind of, I guess, workshop or, or facilitation framework that I've used previously um, by David J. Bland, which is called assumption mapping. And if people haven't used this 
type of system before, it's really about how do we understand all the different assumptions that go into the way we're trying to build something? And then how do we try to discover which of those things are kind of have the least evidence towards that so that we can then go out and discover that evidence? And so um, this idea of like important and no evidence, those are things that we should go and figure out and we should gain evidence around. And so this really inspired me for what does it mean when we have an aspirational strategy. So in that part of the strategy document where we say, we're gonna go after this market segment or we're gonna solve this problem, but we haven't yet, we don't know how to yet, that these are really aspirational strategies and we should define a difference between aspirational, things that have low evidence that are very uncertain versus things that are very certain and things that we already know how to do. Um, and so this is this quadrant that I'm talking about, the aspirational strategies area. And um, these are hypotheses that could work, right? They're things that the leadership team thinks we should be going after and we may not be already. And we want to start then create signals that could show that this is working in some way, but we don't know for sure, right? In the, the kind of parlance of uh, OKRs, it would be baselining certain types of metrics. It'd be starting to explore certain things and, and maybe even in that exploration, the metric is not necessarily an end customer outcome, but it could be how fast are we learning, right? I, those, are, those are all things that could start to be in this domain. The next thing I wanna talk about is really this area that is uh, where we should not be going or strategies that end up being things that we've already tried that are not working. Um, and so, this is a really great talk by Sonia, who she um, works within kind of the complexity world, and, and there's a link to the talk that she gives here really about wayfinding. Um, and I think the way that she starts to interpret strategy that I think is really interesting is this idea of kind of a view outward, where we're trying to go to this distant shore, and we're trying to find our way there, and we know that there's some type of like, what they call a coherence boundary is really this idea of everything that we think should be possible, essentially. And generally people, as leaders end up giving a lot of kind of guidance about where you should go. The part that we don't see as much, and I think we should see more of, is really these functional limits. And in, in this case, it could be extrins extrinsic, which means things like regulations. It could be things that we know we can't do in the marketplace. It could be things that we're specifically not going to go after as far as either customers, problems, things like that. The other side of intrinsic limitations ends up being what do we have the capability of doing? And so, for example, if you have a sports team that is very good at certain types of things, you will not try to make plays around that team that use things that are not part of their team. And so if we don't have machine learning engineers, we probably shouldn't really be focusing on building machine learning from scratch, right? So these are, these are really important aspects about how do we start to like wall off places that we shouldn't be going. And to me, that starts to be in this area where there's kind of known things that we should not be doing. And those known things are actually not, they're important that we actually not do them, right? So this middle thing that we're talking about, this kind of like horizontal line is not just the idea of kind of where are, the, where are we stopping ourselves, but it's kind of like the middle is, is really the stuff that we just are assumptions that maybe are not as helpful. And we wanna make sure that there's a clear distinction between the things that we really should be doing and the things we should not be doing at all. And in the end, I think we can start to learn from other people inside of the marketplace as well. So where have people actually failed trying to do things that we think could have worked? And how do we start to build up an understanding of what does that mean about the marketplace that we exist within? And then my favorite section is actually this last quadrant, which I'm kind of calling bizarro strategies. And this comes from um, Richard Rummel, who uh, if people have ever read Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, it's a great book. Um, he talks about something called fluff which is really this idea of kind of obvious um, restatements, generous sprinkling of buzzwords. These are things that probably you found in almost every strategy you've ever read, at least initially. And things like best in class is one of these pieces of fluff. And the reason why it's important for us to think about this particular type of terminology is that what I've taken away, at least from what Rummelt has written, is that if we can't then take the opposite of what we believe to be true as a good strategy, then our strategy is not valid in itself. And so if we take the opposite of best in class, like would anybody want to be the worst in class around something? And probably not. Now, this is the moment that I start to actually mention, you know, airlines like Ryanair or Spirit Air. <laughs> and they are not necessarily the worst in class. They're just very specific about the 
market that they're going after. They're going after a cost-conscious consumer that does not care about luxury. And that is very different. That's the opposite of what, say, Singapore Air goes after, which is highly luxurious travel between very important international destinations. And that's very different from Southwest that goes after common corridors within the United States for commuters that are doing kind of business travel. Um, and so I think that's the thing that we need to start thinking about is like, what is actually the opposite of our strategy as a way to then make our own strategies better? And so it kind of sits within this domain. Um, Bizarro uh, comes from this idea of people who are comic book fans, Bizarro Superman, which is really the opposite of Superman, um, who's also a valid villain in himself. Um, but I think this idea of like the opposite of what we are is actually a organization in itself. And what starts to become interesting is that when you combine both the things above the line that are aspirational strategies, along with the things that are below the line that are bizarro strategies, you start to create real trade-off models that people can start to consider. And when I say something like even overs, you may have come across them in something like the Agile Manifesto, right? People over process. It doesn't mean that we never do process, but it means in this particular case, we're going to choose this particular thing over something else that is equally valid because we believe that is the right type of choice to make when we're making strategic decisions. And so I think part of what's interesting about this type of framework, at least the way that we've started to see it work, is that when you take things above the line and below the line, you then start to create very interesting trade-off models that you can then give to the team that don't become out of date immediately because they're more about the idea of how do you make hard choices for them easier. <clears throat> and maybe the last thing that I want to talk about when it comes to this like 360 model is really the idea of like evolution of the strategy over time. Because the strategy is not meant to be kind of a point in time that that's the valid way to make decisions. It's supposed to be the way that you make decisions now going into the future. And I've written a post about this, about how strategy is now, but there's no way we can make decisions in the future. There's no way we can make decisions in the past. And so everything that we do today has to in some way allow for adaptability to the current now at all times. And if it is no longer valuable, we should evolve it in some way. And I think that what ends up happening is actually that of evolution happens on say a yearly basis or on a half basis or a quarterly basis when she, we should really be thinking about like the more common times that that happens. And a lot of this is very inspired by something called Wadley mapping, which is another strategic framework by Sam and Wadley Highly recommend it, but it talks a lot about this idea of how do we start to map the components of our business and the way that they evolve over time. And so what that means, if we start to look at this 360 degree strategy kind of overview, is we start to then do a better job, especially of like embodying our strategies if we can actually understand how they evolve. Um, and so for example, when we start to actually take aspirational strategies that have worked in some way, and they turn into working strategies. That means that we have things like metrics that we can start to depend on. We start to have higher certainty that it's actually the right thing. We start to have actual qualitative feedback from the marketplace that these are good things for us to actually adapt and to continue to invest in. New ideas start to come in at a highly uncertain state. And some of those may come in from the standpoint of aspirational, but also from the standpoint that if we're taking something that's aspirational, there should be something that is the opposite that is also what we're not going to do. And we need to make sure that we understand those things. There may be a case that when we start to, when the marketplace starts to change, when the environment starts to change, that things that we have been building for a very long time are no longer helpful, they're no longer valuable to customers, right? There are things that are expected, um, in the world of kind of like the way we consider constant evolution of technology, this is like the idea of overlapping S-curves or constantly like operating on top of each other. There's a certain point that whatever you're doing right now is no longer gonna work. And so in those cases, those turn into then abandoned strategies at a certain point. And then I think like something that we don't do enough of is there are plenty of times where we have an aspirational strategy that is meant to be something that is kind of future looking, what we think is valuable, there's a bet that that is actually something that is going to be good long-term, but we find that the opposite is actually better. And we can then take that and adopt it. As long as we're monitoring these things, we start to do a better job of actually, I think, pulling from the information that is inside the marketplace, even if it's not something that we're currently focusing on. So I think, you know, I 
I wanted to maybe provide a little bit of time for questions if we, if we can do that, but I think there's a bunch of questions you probably already have that I've heard from other teams, and so I want to talk about those really briefly. So when is a strategy no longer valid? And I've started to think about this from the standpoint of kind of Kronos and Kairos time. And so Kronos and Kairos kind of, uh, I think it goes all the way back to Greek kind of mythology, but the idea of Kronos time is that it's a calendar-based time where it could be monthly, quarterly, every half, every year, you end up doing planning cycles. And that's probably something that everybody's actually trying to finish off their current planning cycle, even though it should have been finished last, last month, probably, I, I assume, at least. Um, so that's Kronos, Kronos uh, planning, that's Kronos strategic thinking. Kairos time is more about the idea of like narrative or event-based time, so human time, the way that we start to actually understand the way time works. And what's interesting about that is that inside these 360-degree strategies, we can start to then create also assumptions about that are underpinning these strategic concepts. We can start to then build things like tripwires, which allow us to then analyze, is our strategy still valid? Are all of the assumptions that are underpinning this strategy still valid? And if not, we should take very urgent action to adjust that. And that's related to maybe, um, I started at uh, Facebook Reality Labs working on the portal device in January of 2020. And then in March of 2020, um, no one wanted to go outside. And so in some ways that was a good thing for portal because people need, wanted to be connected, they wanted to talk to their family and their friends and they wanted to feel some type of social presence with other people. But it also meant that some of the programs we were working on that were focused on how do we get people to meet up outside in the world had to be adjusted. And so those OKRs had to be blown up. Same thing with Google when ChatGPT came out. Right? Suddenly everybody was enamored with this idea of generative systems that are talking to people and synthesizing human language in a way that feels very natural. We had to change a lot of plans because of that. And so I think if we're more aware of what are the underpinnings of the way we actually build our strategy, we can do a much better job of actually adjusting when we need to. Maybe the next thing is like, how many things make a full strategy? Um, I've seen strategy documents again that are 30, 40, 50 pages long, um, end up including a lot of information. Unfortunately, most people never read them. And so I guess when we start to think about like, what are the concepts that are valuable here? right? We need to start to talk about like what are the hard decisions that the teams are making. And I, I have a hypothesis that the way that we start to build better strategies are actually what are the escalations that are taking place within the team up to the management team? And the themes of those are actually strategies that need to be defined. And the reason why, because I imagine strategy as kind of a governance system, basically like governing constraints that are being pushed down from leaders to restrict in some ways where we will go and we will not go. But then sense making, right, the people that are closest to the customers, the people that are building things, that are trying to actually make things work on the ground, they're providing sense making back up through the hierarchy to say that these things are not working. And escalations are the way that we actually start to understand that there's something going wrong with the strategy that is not being covered, that is not making this really hard decision that is clearly causing some type of conflict within the team. We need to build a strategy around that. And so, I think this is interesting because it also means that we should be retiring certain things that are just understood within the strategy. So if people just think of something as keeping the lights on or business as usual, whatever acronym you wanna use for that, that's no longer part of your strategy because the strategy is more about the idea of how do you make these really, really hard decisions easier for the rest of the team. Well, what about the things that aren't said? Um, these assumptions, right, that actually underpin all of the strategies and need to be monitored. What we don't do today is we don't actually think about what those assumptions are. And I think that's a real problem. Um, because the issue around monitoring these strategies is that it, it's usually we just come up with a brand new strategy every single year, and we don't tend to adjust them unless we're given such severe market condition changes um, that we actually have to throw everything out anyways. So the truth is, is like the idea of a strategy that exists for a very long time, I, I, I don't know if very many people exist inside of organizations that do that on a regular basis. What is the right specificity? What are these concepts that we're talking about, right? What is inside this even overstatement that I'm talking about? How do you actually provide the right types of assumptions to be tracking? Um, and so I think one of the problems with strategies is that they can be very lofty. 
And so if you start talking about a mission where, you know, if like for Uber, right, let's say we're gonna solve every transportation need for everyone. Like that's not very helpful as a strategy. That could be a good mission and maybe not even a good mission, but that's like a mission that you put on your website. But that's not the mission that actually helps people be functional in the way that they end up making decisions. The moment that people can't use this and actually apply it to their day to day, it's not a helpful strategy. And actually a good test that you can do with any of your strategies, just randomly choose five people throughout your organization and think about how they would actually take that strategy and apply it to their day-to-day -day work. And if you can't think of how they're gonna do that, that's probably not a good strategy. It's too high level, something like that. John Cutler even talks about this from the standpoint that if you can have at least a developer that is saying like this work that you're doing right now, if they can take two to three jumps, even four jumps up to a higher abstraction level of what they're working on, that means a strategy is actually in some way being able to like guide the work that they're doing. But it's also that, you know, again, that plan, that starter strategy that we were talking about is not actually a strategy. Like if you can actually work specifically on the items that are in your strategy, it's not a strategy, it's a work list. And those things go out of date almost immediately. So this framework isn't meant to solve everything. And in, and in fact, I would say that this is a highly experimental one. It's one that I think is interesting and I think these concepts help people think about strategy better. Um, but these are really about tools for practice, right? And so uh, there's a website that, or a community that I'm part of which is called The Uncertainty Project, um, theuncertaintyproject.org, if you wanna check it out. It's a lot about kind of decision making and strategic tools. Um, some of the people that are co-founders of that uh, particular community, they work for a company called .work, and they're thinking about this idea of like, how do we build better tools to be able to, I, mostly monitor kind of conceptual decision making, um, but I've been working with them recently to create what would be kind of a 360 degree view or dashboard for these types of things. Um, so this is again, super early. We're just trying to experiment with it to see if it actually works, to see if it's valuable over time. Like how often will people be accessing this? How often do they, they change it? But this idea of like putting concepts within a map and allowing you to then look at them, alter them over time, and then even start to do automated tracking, not only for values that are for these things that are much more certain, but also starting to look at the underpinning assumptions that are there. I think with generative AI summarization capabilities, we can start to actually do a better job of even, like right now, or at least a decade ago, if you were a product manager, you probably had a lot of Google alerts for things that were in your domain, right? For competitive products. I think there's a certain point that we can start to use some of these tools to automatically say that actually there's a shift in the way the market is actually conceiving or understanding something. So this is kind of the really beginning point. It's something I'm starting to work through with them, but I, I thought it was kind of interesting to show that I think this actually can turn into almost like a dashboard for strategy rather than some type of document that's immediately out of date. So in closing, you know, one of the people that started to use 360 as a concept and a framework within Google, um, what they found really helpful was really clarifying about this difference between the visualization of what we're doing and not doing, um, but also this idea of like, where is the strategic footing here? Most people will not read a humongous document, and if they do, they read it once, but they don't reference it. I think that's something that we end up actually suffering from in a lot of, a lot of organizations don't have a good lattice work of documents, that, as John Cutler would talk about it. And so I think there's something here about the way that we start to actually visualize our strategies in ways that are more durable and are artifacts that last for a longer time. And so think about not only what are the working strategies that you have, but try to push yourself to build out what the designation or the differentiation between working and aspirational. Start to actually create the kind of foundational, what is the opposite bizarro types of strategies. And then be very aware of what actually is happening when it comes to the strategies that you've now abandoned. And, you know, I think what's most important about this is really trying to say what we will do and not do in a way that is helpful for people to do, or to actually understand and manage their strategy over time. And so thank you uh, for the time today. I, I hope you found this interesting. I'd love to connect if you're interested. So thank you.